Democrats. Joining us now, Richard Vigory, author of Takeover, The 100-Year War for the Soul of the GOP and How Conservatives Can Finally Win It. Richard, we welcome you back to America's Forum. Judy, John, always good to be with y'all. Now, now, Richard, when you were last here, your parting comment had to do with finding a governor to run for president. Let, let's develop that notion a little more, and then we'll get back to the midterms. J.D., I think I've lost you there. Uh, yes, sir, we are here. Can you hear me, Richard? No, not really. Mm, okay, well, we'll try I to work just... on that. You uh, said something about a, a governor. Uh, right. Let uh, me just say that uh, I've expanded my governor list, Jay, okay. since uh, the last time. Uh, I think uh, Sam Brownback of uh, Kansas is somebody that we should take a serious look at. I think, uh, you know, I had a list of maybe four or five. I think we can increase that maybe to Rick Scott in, in Florida, as well as Sam Brownback, of course, uh, Scott Walker, Mike Pence. Uh, you know, we've got a a good collection of governors out there. And I still feel strong that we need to leave Washington uh, and look to the states for our 2016 uh, Republican nominee. Richard, there there is no shortage of talent and or ambition within the grand old party, and that includes so many governors. A couple you just mentioned right there. I served with Sam Brown back in the House. I also served with John Kasich of Ohio. During John's days in the House, he was chairman of the Budget Committee. He also maintained a hard line on trading with China. Now he's running for re-election again this year in Ohio, but his birthplace, McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania. Judy, I'm, I'm really keen you can't, hear you. You cannot anymore. hear me, huh? Well, I tell you, let me just ask you. I, I've just lost you, J.D. Okay, well, Richard, we will try to reconnect J.D., I you. can't really hear you, but I know you're talking about Kasich. Uh, let me just say that... Uh, uh, Kasich has been a big disappointment. Uh, I never was a big fan of John Kasich uh, when he was in the House. I thought he uh, was just too close to the establishment and, uh, and enjoyed uh, expanding government. And he's been, uh, you know, uh, very dis, uh, very great disappointment in the uh, uh, as governor of Ohio. And I don't know of any conservative that uh, would like to see him uh, be the Republican presidential nominee. Richard, let me see if you can hear me now. Let there me... you are. Oh, well, good. Well, good. I yeah, hope I'm, I you're... hope I'm not breaking your eardrum, Richard. But you I came through you're... loudly and clearly about your concerns concerning John Kasich. Let me turn to a governor who ran last time around, got hung up on that factor number three, the third agency he wanted to close down. Of course, that's Texas Governor Rick Perry. Your take on Perry for 2016. Well, for uh, for a while, I had a, uh, a kind of a brief uh, uh, affair with uh, Rick, uh, you know, Perry, uh, uh, back in, uh, I think it was 2011. A lot of us uh, went down to Texas, spent a weekend with him and his lovely wife, and just uh, became quite uh, supportive of him. Uh, but unfortunately, he kind of self-imploded there in the, pr in the debates. But, uh, you know, he was somebody that I'd say half of the conservatives that I talked to were supportive of back in 2011 and for a while in 2012. And I think we need to keep our eye on, on Rick Perry. He's a possibility. But he's not probably, you know, on very many conservatives' uh, minds these days. He's got to, uh, you know, prove himself, I think, that he's now ready for prime time, which he clearly was not uh, in 2012. I think also... Uh, uh, J.D., he was uh, surrounded by too many of these big government uh, consultant types. Uh, so we'll see uh, if he surrounds himself with more limited government constitutional you know, conservatives here. Uh, also, people like uh, uh, Rick uh, Santorum, I think, is a strong possibility. I think uh, Rick would like to do it, and uh, I supported him in 2012. It did not probably half or more of the conservative friends of mine. So with somebody uh, we should keep our eye on, Rick Santorum. All right, well, Richard, I want to ask you uh, about another Florida governor. You mentioned Rick Scott, which I think is a very interesting pick, and the guy might have the economic bona fides to back up a potential run here, but I want to focus on a different former Florida governor, and that is Jeb Bush. What do you think about him in potentially being the, you know, prototypical established candidate? Well, when I think of Jeb Bush, I think of Groundhog Day. I mean, I mean, how many Bushes do we have to go through? The, the American people don't like uh, the, the Bushes. They uh, gave uh, 
George H.W. Bush a landslide victory in uh, 1988 because they thought they were voting for Ronald Reagan's third term. A sitting president, George H.W. Bush, got 38 percent of the vote when he ran for re-election re in 92. His son, George W. Bush, uh, got 500,000 votes less than uh, Al Gore in 2000 and won by 537 votes, won by one state for re-election. Uh, I'm, uh, I'd be very concerned uh, if uh, Jeb Bush were the nominee. As a general rule, the American voters do not like big government Republicans. Uh, remember President Bob Dole and President John McCain and President Mitt Romney? Uh, the voters just don't like them. In my lifetime, which is a long time, we've had four big Republican victories. All of those were led by conservatives. In Reagan in 80, Reagan's re-election in 84, the Gingrich contract with America in 1994, and of course the big two part, uh, Tea Party victory in 2010. So whenever you put conservatives as the face of the opposition to the Democrats, people respond with their votes. Put the establishment, big government Republicans, and they vote Democrat. Uh, Richard, a pair of primaries today, well, certainly any number of primary races across the country, but two of a special interest as we take a look at establishment versus grassroots. In South Carolina, Lindsey Graham facing six challengers. The math makes it difficult for a conservative to emerge there. So I'd like to get your take on South Carolina. Also, Virginia 7, as uh, Eric Cantor takes on uh, grassroots activist Dave Bratt. Uh, your take on those two races. Well, uh, J.D., just let me put it in somewhat context. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that I've uh, written this book called Takeover, and uh, these primaries today feed right into the theme of the book there, which deals with the 100-year civil war inside the Republican Party. And it's being played out today uh, more so than maybe any other time in the last 100 years. Uh, but uh, the Tea Party has had great success uh, in moving the Republican Party to the right. And in many ways, we, we've won. Uh, the None of these incumbents, not Lindsey Graham, not Eric Cantor in Virginia, are running on their record. None of them are talking about uh, compromising with the Democrats and growing government, more spending, uh, amnesty. None of them are talking like that. And the Republican agenda in Congress reflects that. But having said that, it is exceedingly difficult, as you know, J.D., to be an incumbent and uh, 90 95 percent of Tea Party victories have come in open races. It's important to challenge these incumbents like Mitch McConnell, etc. But uh, we can't expect to uh, have many victories. Most of our victories come in open races, uh, and I think that uh, Eric Cantor uh, is uh, had much been acting much more conservative since he's uh, had a serious challenge from Dave Brack. And I think that uh, he's going to be held under 60 percent of the vote uh, in today's primary and could even lose. It's, uh, it's going to be a competitive race. And I think it's important for the uh, conservatives to challenge all these uh, incumbents, but we should not be disappointed if we lose. Because uh, literally Dave Bratt in uh, Virginia's 7th Congressional District has been outspent. 25 to 1. I mean, it's just uh, it's incredible the amount of money these incumbents are throwing into the race, and they're not running on their record. So we shouldn't be disappointed if we don't beat the incumbents. But uh, I think we'll just... the number one thing, uh, J.D., today is send them a message. By voting against these establishment Republicans, Lindsey Graham in South Carolina, uh, Eric Cantor in Virginia, is send them a, uh, a message. Because you vote for them, you're encouraging that bad behavior, and they don't uh, realize that that American voters want change, and we want it now. Richard Vigory, author of Takeover. I'm, I'm losing you again. Uh, we, well, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Richard, and we apologize for any audio problems. But, John, we heard Richard loudly and clearly. He says the primaries are really more about principles necessarily than, than actually winning nomination to send a message to the establishment. It sounded almost like he was trying to manage expectations for today's primaries, not really anticipated to go the way that the you know, conservative grassroots want it to go, but that's what we have elections for. We'll find out. Well, right? speaking of expectations, do you have expectations for today's primary? Why don't you tweet us your comments at Newsmax TV, hashtag America's Forum.